This is Susie Hot Rod of Rock and Roller Derby on listener-supported radio WFMU. I am recording here from Union Pool tonight with Big Joni. They are a black feminist punk band from the UK. They're celebrating their second full-length album called Back Home on Kill Rock Stars. They're headed headlining their first shows in NYC. And they just got off a whole bunch of big things and will continue many big things. So please, let me say hello to Stephanie, Shadeen, and Estella. Hi. Hey. Hello. What a pleasure to speak with you. So why Big Joni? Why now? Why is it long overdue? Why more than ever? (laughs) I don't know. That's a hard question to answer. I guess we're just too good to miss, hopefully. (laughs) Uh, Well, I got sick, so um, we had to postpone our East Coast dates. But I'm much better now, so, yeah. Um, I think now's the right time for us. Um, Just who we are and what we represent means a lot to people. And it's a voice that people have been wanting to hear for a while. And um, I think now it's like our time. I also have this feeling of like how important it is to actually see you and talk about like we're black we're feminists and say the words out loud I kind of like to fantasize that this is like you know and people talk about music history how everyone went to see the Velvet Underground and then they started a band like is that happening tonight oh that'd be amazing if it was and we could be like the little VU for the modern era <laughs> The sex, the sex Pistols of the 20s, and there were like 10 bands started. I mean, you know, a lot of people who are doing really well now um, have started because they saw us or, you know, they went to something like Decolonize Fest that Steph and Estella run. Um, so I think we maybe we've already done that, not to <laughs> blow our own trumpet, but in some ways, yeah. Yeah, I hope... Um It'll be a bit of a I was there moment for people here because I think next time we play in New York, we might be in larger venues. So I'm pretty excited about Union Pool tonight. And uh, so how's world domination and black feminist revolution going for you? Perfectly. It's exactly the way we want it. <laughs> it's really cool to be able to um, speak to people who are so willing to like listen to what we're trying to talk about, which is basically... Um, just trying to make a space for all the different marginalised communities and think about how they're all interconnected and how we can actually support each other rather than, you know, fall prey to the sort of distinctions that the powers that be would like to keep us in and how keeping us siloed works in their favour, not ours. So I know there's a saying, it's like the only girl in the mosh pit, but what was it like being the only black girl in the mosh pit? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's hard for like young people now to feel like that, recognise that that was a thing. But yeah, when we were all growing up, we were all kind of into punk and alternative music. And you were usually the only person at a show or the only person in your friend group that liked the kind of music you liked. So you always felt like the odd one out. But I, I remember like, you know, when I was a teenager and listening to this music, I knew that there's no way I was anything like, I wasn't that special. I wasn't any different to anyone else. Like, So there must have been other people like me and... You know, obviously there were there were other like black girls listening to kind of punk in their bedroom. It's about finding a space or something to centre around for like those people to come out of the woodwork and to kind of come back into these spaces. Yeah, I feel like you know, growing up, um, I'd look out for kind of like representation where I could find it. So we had bands like Skunk and Nancy back home. We were like a in the UK, like definitely quite a big rock band uh, when we were growing up and still now, like we've been going for 27 years. And so, yeah, you'd look for like those icons, but they weren't, um, they weren't always common to see like a black woman making alternative music. So like, yeah, we had like Skin, I guess like in the 90s, Shingy in the noughties and stuff, but it was very like, much like the, what's the word like a, finding a unicorn or something yeah, was, and I yeah, think very rare. yeah and I think it's cool now like with the internet and stuff as well it's a lot easier to kind of connect to other black punks and also to find like our history and stuff there's all these pages that are making sure that people from our scenes who were people of color aren't being forgotten and spreading the word and stuff and I found out about a lot of like black punks from the past through that how did you find each other um, well, me and Steph met at a black feminist meeting 
and I added her online. Um, she had a guitar, and then she put an ad out saying that she wanted to start a black punk band. Was there a raincoats tote bag involved yeah, somewhere? Yeah, yeah, so she had a raincoats tote. And then, like, I was on the Facebook group when I saw her, so I added her on there. And, um, yeah, just sort of applied and was like, oh, these are the bands that I like and I want to play standing up. Because I was listening to a lot of sort of C86 stuff at the time, shop assistants, that sort of thing. And it seemed then like quite a simple, easy thing to do for what was meant to be like 15 minutes. <laughs> and now we're still here playing 10 years later. Yeah, 10 years later, yeah. How would you describe the music? Um, I think, I mean, I always describe us as a punk band because that's like the basis and that was kind of the, what kind of brought us all together was punk. But I mean, we take influence from a lot of different things. So like Shadeen said, like a lot of indie and C86, um, definitely kind of from hardcore, alternative music. Um, I really love like 60s girl groups and kind of Motown and soul. So. Um, it's very varied, but ultimately um, its own punk kind of weird thing. I made a note when I was listening to the album that I love the start of In Your Arms, the reprise. It has the, the Ronettes beat. Oh, yeah. So we wanted to do a slow version of it for a while, but then it came out so good. It was like, well, why don't we just put it on the album? And I think, I can't remember what I had been listening to. Um... It might have been either like a Pink Floyd thing or something. You know, like those classic 70s albums where sometimes you get like a different, a, a snippet of a song, like that's, you know, different to the single version. And it's all part of the album listening experience. So we ended up putting the whole thing on the album and people really like it because it's kind of like you're returning, there's a story, you're returning back to another place in a different mood sort of thing. And I think that's really important when people think about making albums. Like it's not just a bunch of singles on, you know, that you're popping on there. It's like you need to take the listener with you. A narrative journey. Exactly, yeah. So the newest album is called Back Home. What is a track from that album that you're really excited to play for the Brooklyn audience tonight? I always like playing Sainted because I get to play the guitar and it's really fun. <laughs> so that's my favorite. Stella gets to have her Van Halen moment in Sainted. Um, I really like playing um, Happier because I just really like that song. Um, I think it's a great single. I wanna feel um, maybe I'm not sure. I love Cactus Tree as an opener because I think it really like shocks people how loud we are and how kind of discordant we can be. <laughs> You just released a new single with Kim Deal of the Breeders. There's a beautiful Aki fruit illustration on the front, and it's a revisit to the song today. Do you want to tell us more? Yeah, yeah. So kind of randomly uh, last year, we were doing an interview, and um, the interviewer asked us kind of our influences or who we'd like to work with. And um, I said Kim Deal, because like, she's such a massive influence on kind of me and has been a massive influence on all of us as, as individuals. Um, and then our manager, um, Simon um, got in touch because like 
he knew her because like obviously they're on the same label back in the day and I told like, you you've hung out with the right people they're yeah. so so great <laughs> yeah we know all the right people <laughs> and yeah so he just like texted her I think and just said would you ever want to work with this band and she was like yeah so fast forward to now um, we had this song and we thought it worked really well with her vocals because it, it was kind of inspired by the breeders and her kind of style anyway um, and it sounds amazing with just so it's so surreal that she's part of like the big Joni universe. <laughs> it's, um, it was really, yeah, just to hear like her raw vocal as well, when we were obviously like putting it together, it was really <laughs> amazing. But uh, I think the coolest thing is like knowing what Kim Deal's um, emoji is, which is like her with a beanie hat. <laughs> so it's just like having that, those really surreal moments with the thumbs up. And it's like, oh my God, Kim Deal's emoji. That's so cool. I think that's been my favorite part of that. Now you've arrived. <laughs> You have opened for some bands. You've opened for Bikini Kill, Sleater Kinney, Idols, you've played Glastonbury. Do you want to give me a highlight, each of you, that you really treasure? Um, I think for me, you know, every band that we played with has been such a, it's like doing an apprenticeship. You learn stuff as you go along. So, you know, with the gossip, it was like watching Beth, how she holds the stage, how she interacts with the crowd, with idols as well. It's like, how do you connect and engage on that scale that they play? And we had to work really hard to, you know, win some of their crowd over but I think in some ways that's a good thing because you, you sort of you kind of like you know f it basically I'm going to <laughs> get you to pay attention to me which is always a good skill to have on stage because it makes you more powerful as well I think um, when we supported Bikini Kill at Brixton Academy which is like a really like a memorable like venue for us it's where we grew up going to see the big bands and like Deftones and stuff like that when we were teenagers and when Shadeen said um, like we're Big Joni we're a black feminist punk band and to have that many people kind of scream their approval like we hadn't experienced it in that scale before it felt like we were part of that kind of like um, uh, what's the word like yeah lineage, lineage yeah, yeah lineage the legacy and to have like Bikini Kill there, the raincoats were up there backstage watching as well, supporting all our bands, so that was a really special time, I think. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've been so lucky that we've been able to meet our idols, and they've all been really lovely as well. <laughs> so, you know, Slater and Kenny were amazing to tour with and play with, and we are party with as well. We partied with them a bit after the show. <laughs> they, they still got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They wrote a song about the party we had. <laughs> That's yeah. really funny. Um, but yeah, we've just been really lucky and just like, have we, that we can keep going with that. <laughs> Estella, I wanted to ask you about your Basis Against Racist t-shirts. Uh, yeah, Lynn from Basis Against Racist got in touch and I've kind of been aware of what they were doing for a while as they had other bassists um, feature in the past, like Dev from Idols and uh, is it Georgia from uh, Nova Twins as well. And so, yeah, they asked like um, which organizations I'd like my T-shirt to support. So, and I couldn't really choose one. So we, um, I picked Gendered Intelligence, um, which is an organization that supports like young trans and non-binary people back home and abortion support network and uh, provide, help provide abortion services in Europe, especially in places where it's really difficult to access, kind of analogous to you know what's going on in certain states here. And then um, also Women for Refugee Women, um, which name's kind of self-explanatory, but yeah, they help uh, women and um, queer refugees as well in the UK. Um, just because I th feel like especially this year in the UK having a kind of like quote unquote culture wars and those are the um, minoritized groups that are always getting negative press from the right wing just for trying to live their lives basically so I thought it was really important to be able to support those communities with that t-shirt. 
And I wanted to ask you about your music video for In My Arms. It's a beautiful music video. It's just like the most romantic, perfect day at the boardwalk and being on the beach and falling in love and then dancing to Big Joni. How important was it for you to show that it was a queer mixed race couple? Um, well, I mean, because some of us are in that sort of relationship, and I think, um, I think just like showing a kind of reality of Black British queer life, because often we get a kind of Americanized version, or people try and copy an American version. So we really wanted to kind of like communicate what it is to maybe be a black or white working class person and trying to find a queer um, existence within spaces that aren't necessarily queer. So the, the room that they're dancing in is a very sort of typical kind of working men's club environment which people don't often associate with like queer spaces and stuff back home. So to have that, um, that sort, of, the sort of opposites of like queering that space with those two young people on their day out at the British seaside, a very typical thing, um, was just really fun to make and the cast was fantastic and the director was brilliant as well, so it was really good. The radio show is called Rock and Roller Derby, and I wanted to just tell you a roller derby story. So when you play roller derby, your jammer scores the points, and you have four blockers helping you or blocking the other team. Oh, you know, okay. All right, great, great. So worst case scenario, when the penalty box is full, it's one jammer and two blockers on the track, just like Big Joni. What, what would your role be in this high-pressure roller derby situation? <laughs> No, I'd just be trying to survive. It's such an intense environment <laughs> sport. I'd just be trying not to get my like neck, knees kicked out. Yeah, I do roller skate a little bit back home, so I'd want to be the nippy one trying to score. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I'd probably be a jammer. I think. Um, I used to play hockey when I was younger and was a goalie, so I play in quite defensive positions, so I think I'd be quite good at that. Do you get, get good cardio drumming, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Oh, we have one more note. Tell me, tell me. So I forgot the fun thing was maybe a first crowd surfer uh, yeah. at the Babies All Right show. Someone was crowd surfing during Cranes in the Sky, which is like an incredibly like slow BPM track so big up to that yeah, person. How did you decide to cover that song? We just all we all loved it and we kind of I don't think any one person suggested it we just all suggested it really. Yeah. yeah. That's good yeah no because when we started playing it none of us could actually play the parts because it's Raphael Sadiq and he's a genius and we were like this is really hard so it was like how can we do our own versions yeah. And I remember us saying, like, oh, what if, you know, Mazzy Star did it, what would it sound like? And it started from there, just completely stripped all the drums back and just made it like a stoner rock song, which really suits the vibe of the song. So it's the lyrically, it's actually quite a dark song in some ways, but it's hopeful, whereas we've kind of gone for the darkest elements of it. Maybe we'll see some crowd surfing tonight at Union Pool. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Have a great show.